Good afternoon, good evening, and hey, possibly good morning. Welcome back to the Ford 50 Channel 4 workshop. And we're talking about workshop channels, sorry. The digital, human, inclusive, and resilient, the future of citizen-centric service. This is our conversation for this afternoon. My name is Rob Butler. I'm an engagement officer and digital disruptor, GC Digital colleague to many at Shared Services uh, Canada. I'm an Asian male with a white shirt with gray hair, and I'm in my home office with some 450 TVs behind me. Uh, and I just want to welcome you to this wonderful channel right now. Perfect. So those of you who are on the GRIP platform right now and may be watching with uh, translation underneath me, uh, you can actually join with the link below. We encourage you to join with the link below so you can join the conversation with our presenters. The Zoom link is listed there. Uh, you'll be able to join the conversation uh, when we get to that point in the, in, the, uh, in the presentation, and it's a much better experience if you don't need the translation portion. However, if you wish to stay in the GRIP, you can stay there and you can watch the presentation as well. Uh, the code of contact, of course, please uh, help us keep this safe and inclusive space for, uh, for all. So the Digital Human Inclusive Resilient uh, Workshop, the Future of Citizen-Centric Service, is a workshop that will unpack some of the key concepts of digital, uh, focusing on digital edge, cloud optimization, automation, and adaptive networks. Uh, we'll cover best practices and guidelines to help design effective, secure, compliant, performant, and scalable architecture, facilitate a trusted exchange of data across government and partners, accelerate service delivery using cloud native digital platforms, and rationalize uh, technology spend with the government and public sector. I'm very excited to introduce Sanj, Liant, KJ, Krishnan, oh, I, I'm sorry, Krishnan, Nan. Let's give a forward 50 welcome to our speakers. Over to you, Liant. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rob, for having us today. We've so been looking forward to participating in the Forward 50 event. And we all strongly agree on the importance of the theme of this event. It's really so special because it creates a forum for open source information of technology for the betterment of our communities and really the enrichment of our lives. All of us at Forward 50, I, I was looking at all the participants and the speakers, we're all in some way part of a human collection of innovators and activists who are committed to using technology for the advancement of all to create a world that's more balanced, a world that's more inclusive and sustainable, and also a world that's more resilient. Today in Canada, we have a unique opportunity to accelerate, as you mentioned, the public-private collaboration and cooperation. And we're really inspired to use technology in ways that give every citizen in Canada seeking a public service equal exceptional experience from coast to coast locally, and also extending that global reach to bring the best of Canada to the rest of the world. Uh, in addition to being a technologist, I'm also a mom. And I recall in the early days of the pandemic, the fear I had when my daughter was ill and I needed to have her seen by a doctor, I was really torn between the need for her to receive that essential medical treatment and the risk of exposing her to a virus in a medical facility. And I didn't need to make that choice. Uh, technology allowed for a real-time medical appointment via video that allowed my daughter to be treated while also keeping her safe and keeping me safe. And I was able to schedule the appointment, confirm insurance, speak to a doctor, get a prescription, and pay for everything virtually. When we expand the possibilities with digital, we can really offer best-in-class services of all kinds to all of our citizens in urban and rural locations. Location really no longer dictates the availability of a service or the quality of that service experience. We're also able to optimize cost and time, both for providers and for the consumers who receive those services. And we can connect people and businesses together in ways that really create innovation and advancements we really never thought possible at the current pace of change. In our session today, as you mentioned, Rob, we're gonna be talking about the components of digital options to achieve these human advancements. 
We're also gonna to touch on the importance of partnerships and the incredible outcomes for our communities and for our citizens that are powered by speed, connections, and insights of digital that were really not possible in the past. My name is Leanne Storacci. I am the leader of Global Technical Architecture and Strategy at Equinix, which is the world's digital infrastructure and platform company with over 240 global locations uh, that recently invested 1.5 billion to expand our presence into 13 metros in Canada. I'm joined today by my teammate and technical principal, Sanj Srikrishnan, and he is based in Toronto. We also have our partner, KJ Burke, who's a principal technology strategist in hybrid cloud from CDW of Canada. He's also based in Toronto. And CDW is the largest technology solutions provider in Canada. We're gonna be talking today as a team about the core components of digital strategy. If you look at all of the possible options of data, networking, cloud, security applications, as a service software, it can be really overwhelming. We wanna offer some information today and some insights to sequence the digital journey and also to simplify the roadmap of strategy for the public sector. I'm also gonna moderate a panel of three to discuss the future of digital services for the citizens of Canada. We're going to discuss some specific public sector use cases we think are of particular interest here in this forum. And we're going to end with a showcase by Krishnan, who's a digital architect on our team of the Anywhere workforce. We know that talent is coast to coast in Canada. So how do we really enable our Canadian citizens to work efficiently and productively from rich cultural centers like Montreal to majestic Western communities like Calgary. So with that, I am going to pass this to my colleague, Sanj, who's going to take us through the digital overview uh, so we can share those insights with you today. So Sanj, I'll ask you to pop on your video and we will turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Leanne. So jumping right into this, folks, what does it take to be digital ready? That's an interesting question we get faced with day in, day out. And really, oops, it would help if I actually had the right screen on. Uh, <laughs> there's really, um, digital transformation is really changing all industries, public sector included, right? Citizen services included. All markets are now global. Gone are the days where we're worried about what are we doing in our city or even in our province? It's all about global uh, business these days. Shared economics are transforming capital intensive industries and information is the product. This is key. How do we solve for this? What are the key components of digital? When we, when we look at the industry and we look at everything happening in the technology landscape, we can break digital down into these three core compo three components, key components. First one is the digital core. Second one, digital ecosystems, and the third one, digital edge. And let's unpack each of these individually. The digital core is really where your nest egg is, where all of your core information, your core technology sits, right? And what's happening in this arena is that this is quickly transforming to become cloud adjacent, where information is king and keeping that information as close to as where you do your processing is key, right? Digital edge is the, is the next topic I wanna to talk about. And what the digital edge is really solving for is proximity. So as Leanne said, our, our mandate in Canada and what we're trying to do by investing $1.5 billion in, in all things Canada by expanding to 13 metros is to bring the digital edge coast to coast, is to allow folks in Calgary to feel as if they are as close to applications and services as the folks in Toronto and Montreal do. Right, And I'll ask you guys a question. When was the last time you waited longer than a second or two when you did a Google search? That's what we're bringing to Calgary right, and Western Canada. And finally, digital ecosystems. And this, in my opinion, is one of the key concepts of digital. The ability for partners, customers alike to access counterparties that can help them achieve their end goal. 
So for example, for the government of Canada, this could be as simple as accessing a payments processor from your digital edge or your digital core, or something as complicated as accessing machine learning or AI. But here's the secret. Almost half of C-suite executives admit they do not know where to start when de developing their digital transformation strategy. This is from a survey done by Intelligent CIO. Well, we believe we have the answer to that. And we believe that network is the foundation of digital transformation. And this is an, another interesting factor for you guys. 65% of executives out there reported that the current infrastructure is struggling to adopt the rapid adoption of digital technologies. Now, here's the crazy thing. This was a stat that was obtained prior to the pandemic, prior to the world shutting down in March of 2020, right? This is gonna be eye-opening for you folks. This is an analysis done by our friends at Cisco through their global VNI IP traffic study. And it shows traffic volume growth in exabytes uh, on a month to month basis, right? And 2020 through 2022 is a projection. Now keep in mind, 2020, 2021 was a projection, but look at the values from 2020 to 2022. It's projecting that global traffic is doubling to 400 exabytes per month. So for those of you that don't know, an exabyte is an astronomically large number. It's equivalent to streaming every single movie that's been created in 4K at the same time, simultaneously. It's a lot of data, a lot of content. And what's really interesting is that Equinix, we ourselves do a landmark annual study called the GXI, the Global Interconnectivity Index. And our study is forecasting something really interesting as well, and very similar to this, that by 2024, private interconnection bandwidth, so meaning, connectivity from one party to another party privately will be 15 times larger than the public internet, reaching a compounded annual growth rate of 44% to 21,485 terabits per second. That's ridiculous. It's a crazy, crazy, crazy number. So when you have traffic growing at an exponential volume, how do you provide services to your constituents to your staff, to your employees, right? Here are the current state constraints that everybody is experiencing globally. One, network latency. This is the Western Canadian example, right? Physical distance causes poor response times. So let's think about the folks out in Vancouver and Calgary. They're sitting a minimum, conservatively speaking, 46 milliseconds on the fastest private link from Calgary and um, Calgary and Vancouver out to the cloud regions and the and the compute in the government data centers sitting in Toronto, Montreal, and Ottawa. Now, 46 milliseconds doesn't seem like a lot, but when you factor that into a really chatty application, huge, massive. That translates into three to four second delays per page load time. Second current state constraint is WAN complexity. Really complicated WAN networking topologies can't scale. It becomes very difficult. I mean, for those of you on this call that, that are working in telecommunications, you're used to lead times of four to six months for connectivity to increase bandwidth, right? Cloud performance. This is a big one related to the latency. So as you're deploying applications in the cloud regions, which are all located in Toronto and Montreal for Canada, imagine the folks out West and the latency they're having in reaching those cloud regions over your private WAN or the public internet, right? find operational risk. This is huge, right? A lot of organizations are looking at shifting operations and connectivity to the public internet, which causes challenges and it increases your threat risk exponentially. Now we're not saying the public internet is bad. We're saying use the public internet selectively and we'll get into some of these use cases later on. And finally, a rigid network. So traditional ways of building networks don't work anymore. Building once and running all of your traffic on it and saying, hey, give me your application to run on my network doesn't work. Your network needs to be responsive. So our, our, our thought process is this. Digital transformation requires a digital core, right? And what does this mean? And in all the right places specifically, and what does this mean? It means taking all of your core sites, where your key knowledge, your key platform, your key application and data sit, where they sit, and interconnecting them to one another. So what this means is one, localizing the traffic to solve for latency. So if you have eyeballs in Calgary, why have them 
come all the way to Toronto to get an application. There are technologies in place that could help reduce the latency and serve that content locally in Calgary to those eyeballs. Two, optimizing the network. And this is key, allowing your network to make decisions on where to route traffic as and when it needs to. Three, simplifying your cloud strategy. So from each of your on-ramp locations, from each of these core and edge locations, connecting to the public cloud and enabling that cloud access locally so that service delivery and experience, user experience is improved dramatically. Four, peering directly with partners. So if you have partners in market that you're using, uh, you know, and an example of this is uh, what Leanne was talking about earlier with the healthcare example, right? Leverage those partners locally to provide you video conferencing services in market. Zoom is an example of this, right? Um, and number five, leverage business ecosystems. So use interconnection as a tool to connect to your partners, to your customers, to your counterparties securely and privately to reduce risk and complexity. And this is really the segue into the next point. Digital transformation requires a digital ecosystem with all the right partners. So what does this mean? And this is a quick quote from uh, McKinsey and Company, and I'm sure you guys know all, you know all about them. Failing to embrace digital platforms is the biggest pitfall in a digital strategy. Digital ecosystems will account for more than $60 trillion in revenue by 2025. So before we talk about digital ecosystems, I wanna show you something really quickly. This is Equinix's public sector evolution story. And really what it is, is these are, this is our global footprint, a quick snapshot of what we do. And these sites that are highlighted in green, all of them provide what we call digital core, digital edge, and digital exchange capabilities to counterparties, specifically for public sector. And these are all the sites around the world that we have public sector customers and clients operating in. And why we, why we have this many public sector customers and clients is because of this one slide. And I wanna spend a minute on here, right? So globally, we're the only partner that, that uh, or only provider that operates in 63 metros with 240 odd data centers, 300 plus public and protected B accredited clouds. So think all of your workloads being able to go into the cloud via Equinix. 10,000 government and public sector enterprises, and here are the key points. For those of you that, for, for those of you that it matters, for NIST 800-53, or as our friends in SSC put it, ITSG-33, FISMA high certified, and ISO 27001 as a global standard. So what does this mean to the public sector? What it means is all of the services offered within this concentric ring that is Equinix has all of the accreditation that you need to house PII, personally identifiable information of the citizens of Canada. From this ring, you have choices because within our global portfolio of 2,400 network and IT service providers, and I'll show you what that looks like in a second, right? 300 plus clouds that we talked about and utilizing our global backbone, which we'll talk about in a minute, you have the ability to connect to any counterparty locally within Canada or globally on demand in 90 seconds or less. And yes, that sounds like a lot, but let's, that sounds like a little, and then it sounds like, uh, you know, I'm making up a bunch of stuff, but you know, this is where the heavy lifting comes from my colleague, Krishnan, who will be showing you this later on and how we actually do this with a couple of our cloud partners. So when we talk about counterparties, this is a quick snapshot of who you can connect to within our facilities. And this is just talking about financial services, content and digital media and cloud computing, right? And these are the three biggest uh, counter our industries we deal with globally. And then you talk about clouds and this is where it gets interesting. All of these on-ramps you see with the red circle around it, right? And you can't see some of them because they're covered in green, but we have 50 plus strategic markets. And this, this number is actually closer to about 59 globally today that provides seamless cloud connectivity when and where you need it, right? And if we carry this on, enterprise customers, payments and commerce, and finally healthcare, this is huge, right? And more importantly, this is a page that talks frankly to all of our partnerships and the partnerships that revolve our platforms rather that run on platform Equinix globally to service their customers. 
Digital transformation finally requires data at the edge. And this is utilizing everything we talked about to enable all of the right possibilities, right? The number one reason for deploying at the edge is low latency. Once this was only a challenge for financial companies operating in capital markets, now low latency is the most important metric that IT decision makers uh, look at in this day and age. So let me ask you a question that I asked before. How long have you waited for longer? Uh, sorry, <laughs> that, that's a tongue twister. Let me try this again. When was the last time you waited for longer than you know, a second or two for a page to load on Google? Google figured this out a long time ago. You know, you know, and they like to say that they run the fastest or they run the largest fiber optic network in the world. The real reason they have that network is to do what their core business is, which is serve ads to you. And that's not a bad thing. They figured this out, latency is king, right? And with latency, what is the dominant factor? What it is, is the physical distance that packets need to travel. So if I throw this map up again, right? Or this diagram up again, Look at the distance packets need to travel for our friends in Western Canada to reach all of the services and resources located in Eastern Canada. Becomes a bit more prob a bit problematic. What we're, what we're doing at Equinix is enabling seamless connectivity to the clouds, networks, and compute out West in conjunction with our cloud partners sitting out East. And I'll show you how all of that works in a second. Now I want to throw this slide back up really quickly because everything we're talking about from here on out sits inside this secure Equinix ring full uh, with full uh, NIST 800-53 slash ITSG 33 accreditation and ISO 27001 certification, right? So what does that look like? We're uniquely positioned to help you succeed because like I said, everything is built on the backbone of our data center services. These are the 240 odd buildings we have around the world that have the accreditations we talked about. Once you look at those buildings and once you get into one of those buildings, we've built a state-of-the-art turnkey network that believe it or not, utilizes all of the providers, private connectivity through all of the providers that form the backbone of the internet to offer you software defined networking capabilities that allow you to connect from anywhere in the world to anywhere else in about 90 seconds or less. And it's crazy. And most recently, what we've done is we've launched digital products like our network edge or tactical edge, as we call it, our Equinix metal stack that allows you to seamlessly burst workloads from the public cloud sitting on the platforms that you use in the public cloud to private metal instances sitting at the edge. And finally, our precision time product, which really allows you to get super, super accurate time when and where you need it, right? So to, re to recap, we're in all the right places with all the right partners, giving you all the right possibilities. And I wanna to touch on one key thing, partners. So I said this before, we are, believe it or not, a real estate income trust. We're the largest technology company most people have never heard of, but in essence, we're a real estate company that's changing the technology game. And to allow us to do what we do, we provide all these primal, foundational infrastructure services, but we require partners such as our friends CDW to help us de deliver, deploy, and uh, scale this infrastructure. And with that, we present you the, cre we create the foundational infrastructure you need to succeed. I'm gonna pass it off to my friend KJ Burke to uh, talk to you about what CDW does and how they can help you. KJ? Hey, thanks, Sandra. Really appreciate that. Um, I'm going to bring a couple of uh, you know points, uh, findings for some of the reports that we we do here in Canada to to you know kind of prove out some of the the conversation pieces. But but Sans does a good job of laying out really you know what Equinix brings to the table. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we like partnering with Equinix. So we, we do feel that they have a, a significant value add you know in this space. And and one of the things that that uh, Sanj and, and Leanne sort of spoke to uh, a little bit was was that. Um, you know, a lot of these changes are really being sort of forced on us and, and you know, sea level within organizations and, and you know, directors and, and decision makers within the government. It, it's difficult to, to really keep up with the demands that, that you're experiencing. And so when we talk about digital first, when we talk about establishing that digital footprint, um, it really is a lot about agility. 
So, you know, when we, when we surveyed uh, IT leaders across Canada as part of our cloud report, one of the findings that we have is that it, it, the innovation and the demands are not being driven from inside of, of organizations. It's really being demanded from, from external to organizations. You know, uh, people, the citizenry, they want services faster. They want services easier. And I think Leanne uh, really made a good point about, uh, you know, being able to take advantage of healthcare services within, you know, her own home. And, and so more and more, that consumerization of, of how we approach services, uh, being able to, to really you know, uh, get services how we want, when we want, um, really puts the pressure on IT organizations to be able to meet those needs. So we need a certain level of agility. We need a certain level of flexibility. If you could flip to the, the next one. So, so where does CDW Canada fit in? Well, CDW as a global organization is a very large organization. Uh, you know, we are uh, 161 uh, in the Fortune 500. We have uh, a, a very large number of sales that we do globally. We have great relationships with key partners. And, and we try to leverage that uh, really to, to help our, our customers. And so, you know, whether that's the public sector, whether that's the private sector, we try to leverage those relationships to bring uh, everything to bear so that our customers can be successful. If you can flip to the next one. Uh, but specific to Canada, you know, we're located in nine different locations across Canada, pretty much every place that has a hockey team. Uh, so we do have a sales team and solutions architects that are local to uh, Ottawa. Uh, I'd love to engage with, um, you know, with you on, on your projects, but we are spread across the country. And so, you know, when San shows that, that map of Canada and, and really lays out the, the locations that Equinix is, is in, uh, we have boots on the ground at all of those locations to assist you with, with your needs. So as we kind of go through this and, and we talk about this, this um, you know, digital transformation that we want to help enable, know that, that tactically uh, there are people available in those, uh, those geographies to, to assist. You know, one of the things that we have that we can bring to bear that, that um, you know, I don't think enough customers really take advantage of is pre-sales solutions architecture. We have a very large pre-sales solutions architecture team. They, they you know, help ideate and help our customers sort of build up what those solutions can look like, work with partners like Equinix to make sure that you understand what the capabilities are. So that as you're making the decisions at the beginning of the project, you're, you're, you're kind of, you're starting down the right path to begin with. If you could flip to the next one. So we break down these different areas into, you know, a couple of different focus areas. And so, you know, the hybrid cloud, really the modern data center and the public cloud and how we bring those together, how we work with partners like Equinix to help bridge those and, and make those efficient and manageable, um, bring agility so that agility isn't just something that we think of in the cloud. It's really how we operate, you know, in the on-premises data centers as well. And I think Krishnan is going to show that later. Um, you know, emerging technologies, whether that's uh, artificial intelligence, HPC, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality. You know, when you think about, you know, healthcare, I think Leanne brings up a, a good point there. You know, one of the important things is we think about citizens and, and servicing them, uh, especially, you know, in their own homes, is what are some of the services that we maybe have not been able to provide that will be very, very important to provide, like, you know, natural language translation. And so when you look at the ability to, um, you know, for, for people that, that maybe don't speak English or French as well, um, being able to translate into a, a dialect that they fully understand as they're dealing with medical transitioners, that's critical um, because there's a lot of nuance to healthcare that can be lost. Um, and so having that as something that really enhances that remote um, user experience, that remote uh, citizen experience when they're taking advantage of, of some of the services. You know, the modern workplace, I think Sanj, uh, we're going to do, we're going to dive into this a little bit more, but really it's, it's working, you know, anywhere uh, that, that, that we can. And, and one of the interesting things that came out of one of our mo most recent surveys is the, the public sector has been able to, in a lot of cases, sort of shrink the work week in response to COVID. There's a lot of organ, you know, parts of the organizations uh, and the agencies that have been able to go to a four-day work week to really help accommodate you know, the, the challenges around um, uh, COVID and, and some of the pandemic challenges that we've had. So, so I think, you know, again, that, that's going to be important. That's an area of, of investment for us, and we'll talk about it in a minute. And then security. We, 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 we put security on its own because we know we need to focus on security, but security is really around everything that we do. So another finding uh, here really is that um, 
there's a couple of ways that that people uh, in in the public sector, people in the private sector, are approaching IT and and investments in IT. And, and there's digitally distraught and digitally determined uh, organizations. And so when you look at at your team and and how your team is adopting technology, digitally distraught organizations that are really struggling with hybrid cloud, with with really um, bringing you know, new capabilities to their, their customer base or their citizens quicker. Um, what they're struggling with is they're focusing more on cost savings and, and uh, um, you know, equipment purchases and things like that. Whereas digitally determined organizations are, are really focused on how are we bettering our processes? How are we doing things faster? And so again, I think, you know, Krishnan's going to show a really good example of, of how you can uh, act faster. And I think Sanj was, was talking a bit about how do you how do you provision networking links faster? Well, you, you do it by, by making it, it digital rather than a physical uh, MPLS link you're putting in place. Um, so I'll provide links to the cloud report and, and the security study, you know, as, as part of this, um, as part of this presentation, but there's a lot of good findings in there. They're not necessarily product uh, focused. If you could flip to the next one, please. So our approach is CDW Canada. You know, we work with our customers. Uh, we help, uh, you know, find ways to help them mature what they are doing. You know, again, whether that's from a security perspective, maybe that's agility around IT, maybe that's observability and, and really uh, focusing on that end user experience or that customer experience. But we help our customers mature. Uh, we, we work with our customers to understand their goals and objectives, you know, discover and collaborate with our customers. What's the current state? What's the desired to be state? Really focus on those business objectives, architect solutions, and design ways to deliver those solutions so that, that you meet your goals and objectives and, and you're able to, to service your internal, external customers effectively. Deliver those solutions. Uh, and then, and then we, you know, we don't view this as a, a point in time. We don't, deliver, we don't view that we've delivered a project. Or we've helped you deliver on your projects and your goals. It's really a relationship. So it's how do we take the information that we've learned? How do we work with you on that next opportunity? So we really view the, you know, our, our interaction with customers as a continuum and our interaction with, with our partners like Equinix and, and some of our other technology partners. Again, we're, we're constantly learning what they have to provide. We're changing our business model. They're changing their business model. And, and your needs are constantly changing. So, so that's kind of how we view uh, our relationship with our customers. So from a security perspective, um, you know, again, viewing security is, is really integral to, to everything that we do. You know, governance, risk, compliance, and, and capabilities are, are a key challenge for organizations. So again, whether you're in the public sector uh, or private sector, you know, Sanj made a good point there, um, really around, around security certifications, you know, having um, uh, the right accreditations to house data, uh, manage data, curate data, share data where you need to, uh, but do it in a secure way. And, and that's a that's a challenge that that you know everybody in Canada is really facing. There's there's uh, you know limited availability of people that can that can do the work. It's very challenging to to get those on your teams. For smaller agencies, it's very hard to have somebody dedicated to specific technologies, specific processes. So, you know, this is again another area where we step in with with our, our customers to help them design their cybersecurity platform and and then deliver on those and, and make sure that those. Um, those platforms that are being developed, that those frameworks that are being aligned with really meet your goals and objectives, because just adopting a framework, but not really adapting it to, to what you need is, um, you know, it, it creates gaps. So our security uh, practice, you know, it's 100 plus uh, security professionals. Um, we have certifications, you know, secret, secret two, controlled goods clearance. Uh, so we're, we're able to, to engage and, and discuss with you, um, you know, whether it's, it's something large like an RFP and, and we need to go off site and work with you uh, to, to access the document to make sure that, that we're, um, you know, keeping tight uh, control of that, that information um, and, and things that are smaller, but, but know that, you know, we have those certifications. Uh, we, we have the ability to, um, you know, to pr provide those services for you. You know, another one of the security findings is really that multi-layer security um, is, is going to be more effective for our customers. And so again, you know, uh, Sanj lays out a great, um, you know, really a great story around the network and the investments that, that Equinix is making in, in, in providing capabilities to their customers. One of the challenges with that is that it becomes more complex. And, and so, uh, you know, it's great to have options, um, but options can make things more complex complex on the back end. And so again, with security, it's the same thing. 
the additional layers of security is 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 great. You know, we want to protect that data. We want to protect people's personal information. We want to make sure that your intellectual property is safe. Uh, but having those additional layers is it, it does add to your overall complexity. And so again, that's where we like to partner with um, with customers. That's where we like to work with you know some of our key security vendors to really make sure that we're providing that and we're helping our customers um, by delivering that uh, that security you know in layers to meet their goals and objectives. So and also to, to better support that, we have a 24 by seven uh, SOC knock. It's fully redundant between Toronto and Calgary. Um, again, you'll see protected B status, controlled goods. Uh, we have, um, you know, that, that was manned in sometimes remotely uh, during the pandemic, but, uh, but as we've been able to, uh, to really, um, you know, get some people back into the office that are that are vaccinated in a secure way. It, it is it is a facility that's managed 24 by 7, uh, 365 days a year for our customers. Um, we follow you know ITIL and NIST best practices and um, and are uh, ISO certified. So again, you know, secret clearances um, and uh, controlled goods. You know, where we need in order to to really dig into um, you know your business goals and objectives. And then these are just links provided. So the cloud report is an annual report. Uh, the next report will come out in early in Q1 of, of 2022, um, be focused on some of the changes sort of post COVID and how that is. Security study is something we've done annually for I think the last seven years. I think this is gonna be our eighth or ninth security study coming up in 2021. Again, the, this, these data insights are specific for Canada. Um, we do make an effort to pull out um, you know, public sector you know, as an area of focus. We have, uh, you know, worked with um, the CGE podcast to, to bring some of that content, uh, you know, to you directly. Um, but again, uh, we have a sales department in Ottawa. We have solutions architects available. We'd love to engage with you uh, and, uh, and really sort of bring insights out of that that's relevant to, to you and in your line of business. Thanks so much, KJ. I was struggling to get off mute there. Um, so Leanne, I'm going to pass it to you, if you don't mind, for the next fun portion of our, of our conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanj. I, I appreciate it. And thank you for those insights uh, for Sanj and, and talking about the foundational structure for digital and breaking down the components. And then KJ, I want to thank you for the exceptional partnership that we have with CDW. Uh, your company has a long history and a distinguished reputation in Canada as technical consultants, technical designers, and integrators. And what I think everyone really values most about CDW is that engagement is on a continuum because the digital journey doesn't end. You know, we continue to innovate. We continue to see new entrants to the market who uh, bring new functionality to the digital landscape. And so we need to remain current, but you know, just like some companies at some point were called too big to fail, I think the universe of digital is too big for one company alone to master. You know, we really do need partners to who bring their unique value to the picture to help us to optimize all of the options in digital. And I think CDW has done a phenomenal job of demystifying digital for Canadian organizations and making sense of that full journey that you described, which does operate on that continuum. And so I thought it would be good at this point for us to have a bit of a conversation about using technology uh, to be in service to Canadians from coast to coast. And how do we think about digital components to better the experience of our Canadian citizens? So I'll start with you first, KJ. Can you talk a little bit about why organizations should have a digital first approach and really where should they start? Yeah, that's a great question, Leanne. I appreciate it. And, and you know, thank you for the, the good introduction there. I, you know, digital first is, is really tied to agility. It, it's, it's fundamentally with, with digital first, when you've abstracted away, you know, some of the hardware, you know, Sanj makes a good point about the network. When you've abstracted away some of the complexities about ordering a physical network link and, and the lead times involved, and you really turn it into a, a, a software or, or a digital change, um, it, it speeds up your time to, to value. And so it's really being able to focus in and, and be agile 
to support not only your business goals and objectives, but the needs and demands that your customers or your citizens have. And so, so by focusing on digital, by focusing on a digital way to deploy those services to, to meet those goals and objectives, you shorten your time to value. So, so I think that's, you know, initially there was the idea of sort of cloud first. And what's happened is we've been able to uh, really take traditional infrastructures, traditional uh, types of technologies. We've been able to modernize them with a cloud operating approach. And so that's why you're able to, and, and Christian's going to Christian's gonna show this later, the ability to, through APIs, make changes on the fly to, to really meet your, your needs is, is really critical. We just can't keep up. We can't keep up with the, the demand you know, without, without really viewing digital first as, as our strategy. And, and that includes what we do in the data center, not just what we do in the public cloud. No, I, I absolutely agree. And, and you had mentioned cloud first, and this is a question I'm gonna to pose to Sanj, because we, Sanj and I were having this conversation before, there are terms that are often referred to digital first and cloud first, and so really what's the difference? And we were talking about digital being a universe, and cloud is really a planet in that universe. So Sanj, can you talk a little bit about the difference between what's, what's really digital first, and then how do we think about cloud first? So Leanne, you summed it up best. Think of digital first as the entire universe. Anything's possible. Whereas cloud first is a planet that sits within, or multiple planets rather, depending on how you view the cloud and where it is, sitting within that universe, right? At the end of the day, cloud first allows you to, you know, depending on which, uh, whether you view the glass as half full or half empty, fail fast or succeed early, right? One or the other. Can't have both, one or the other, right? But what it does is it allows you to rapidly innovate, rapidly test new concepts, deploy things really quickly, and accelerate your time to market. But where cloud first has a fundamental challenge is as you scale up and as you get more dependent on it, your costs exponentially increase. And this is, this is not something that I'm saying. For those of you that are interested, have a look at the, at the one of the landmark papers that came out earlier this year by Andrew C. Horowitz around the trillion dollar cost of cloud. That basically sums up in, in a nutshell that says, look, use cloud for when you need it, which is as you're growing, as you're developing, as you're deploying early stage, but get out of it before you start to grow and put on scale and size, because it, it's a compounding problem. Where digital first solves for this is exactly what KJ said earlier. Situate yourself in an environment that allows you to programmatically interact with infrastructure. Gone are the days where you really have somebody doing a point and click. And I mean, those capabilities are still available. But generally speaking, in a digital first world, you want to be using tools such as Terraform, such as Ansible, such as Jenkins to automate your CI CD flows, to treat your infrastructure as if it was code, to tell it to do what you need to do, what you need it to do, when you need it to do it, and how you need it to do it on demand. That's the digital first world, allowing you to use the tools that you need to accomplish a task at the end of the day. No, I, I think that's that's a really good way of putting it, Sanj. It's that balance between using cloud in a very purposeful way and in sometimes a limited way, and then also having adjacent infrastructure and optionality to allow you to have the best of both worlds, optimizing the functionality and, and the choices uh, that are very purposeful to achieve certain outcomes with certain data sets and applications or user experiences, and then not using it for things where it's really not purpose-built or appropriate anymore. So that yeah, management of actuality, yeah. You're bang on, Leanne. And if we look at markets like Calgary, I love going back to Calgary because it's the third, fourth largest population base, depending on what's happening in Vancouver nationally. And it's forgotten out West, right? Services are not available there. One of the things we're doing that that's news to most people is we're deploying our Equinix metal stack out West. And the idea here is believe it or not, programmatic seamless integration with the public clouds. So whether you're running on Amazon with Outpost Anywhere or Google with Anthos or Microsoft with Azure Arc, seamlessly being able to burst connectivity and applications from East to West. And that's compounded using our partnerships with companies like CDW, Dell Apex, mm -hmm. Uh, HPE GreenLake, Cisco Plus, name it. They're all set up and ready to go for this. It's, it's a crazy new world we're in. Yeah, 
Uh, absolutely. And and speaking of this growth in this new world that it creates, I mean, KJ, I'll, I'll pose this question to you. With the increase of the options of digital and that you know explosion of data, there's also been an increase in cybercrime and fraud. So isn't digital unnecessarily risky? You know, it has great benefit, but does it not uh, do those risks not outweigh those benefits? What's your what's your position on that? Yeah, I, I think that um, you know any new technology has you know potentially a different risk um, profile, and and that's why you know really security needs to be a part of everything that we do. Uh, I, I think Sanj makes a good point around sort of the programmatic approach to infrastructure, and and you know again, if we are able to deploy something. We're able to secure it. We're able to, to really wrap the right processes around it. And then every time we go to do that deployment, we're deploying it in the same manner, we can actually reduce risk. And so, you know, where organizations are investing in digital first, where they're, they're really uh, investing in improving their processes, where they're investing in uh, taking that, um, that firewall, making it a virtual appliance, really providing it to the developers earlier in their development process, those are ways where security can really be improved overall. You know, the biggest thing, um, and this was something that came out of our cloud report, one of the biggest areas of investment now is, is for organizations and agencies to understand the shared security model. So, you know, it's, it's, it's important to understand that when you're operating in a public cloud provider, you're operating in somebody else's data center. There's certain things that they'll take care of. There's certain things that they won't take care of. And, and it's also important to understand that the, um, you know, the unrestricted flow of networking traffic that you may have on your on-premises data center is, is not something you really should be configuring in the public cloud in that manner. So it requires, it requires more understanding of, of your, your footprint. And, and that's again, kind of where we come in. I think that's again, where, where some of the value of the Equinix uh, proposition we're talking about today, where you have that infrastructure that's really distributed, that's consistent, that, that you know, is global reaching or, or cross Canada reaching. That's where there's a lot of value there. And thank you, KJ. And Sanj, maybe I'll ask you to add on to that a little bit because there's two different types of security uh, postures that we think about uh, when we talk about constructing a full digital solution coast to coast in Canada and potentially globally to serve Canadian citizens wherever they may be living. So can you talk about the physical piece of that security and then how that ties into maybe the digital piece of that security? And you're on mute. You know, it's not a Zoom session unless you've gone on mute and started talking and then into a soliloquy. <laughs> Somebody's <laughs> saying you're on mute. Um, so that's a really good question, Leanne. So we'll talk about this with two, in, in, in two aspects. First is the physical security. So like I said uh, earlier, um, Equinix facilities around the world, the majority of them in, in friendly countries, we'll put it out there, have base accreditation like, uh, like NIST 800-53, or as we call it here in Canada, ITSG-33, right? And our ISO 27001 standard, which talks about uh, physical security and security operational procedures. That alone is, is, is just a starting point because that provides the secure landing spot for all of the services that KJ talked about, all of the, the ability for you to do your digital services. Now, where Equinix is changing the game in Canada is through our Equinix fabric. So what we've done nationally, and as Leanne said earlier, we invested $1.5 billion roughly in Canada to acquire 13 or sites in 13 different metros from Bell Canada. As part of that acquisition, what we've done is we've built a national backbone that ties into our global backbone, and I'll show you what that looks like in a minute, um, where you can now create secure connectivity from one point on that backbone to any other point globally. So whether it's locally in Canada through in-country terrestrial routes, right, data resident routes, or globally to any other counterparty in the world in 90 seconds or less. And what makes this whole story even crazier is just two months ago, we've launched what we call EPL functionality on this backbone. So now you have the ability to nail up hard layer two links. For those of you that are in the security world, you know what I mean by this, you're gonna start freaking out. It means native MACSEC capabilities from any point to any point globally on our backbone. Mm -hmm. 
and better. So MaxSec is just a tip of the iceberg. If you're doing secret top secret type workloads, gets even better than that. Any appliance you run on that backbone allows you to transit black data anywhere in real time, 90 seconds or less software defined. Right, and, yeah. and that's where the, the inter intersection of physical and digital is going because all of that fully API driven. No, no, absolutely. I think it's that orchestration layer that makes that possible and seamless, Sanj. And then I think we have time for one final question, which I'll pose to KJ before we're going to go into the use cases and the demo. So can you talk a little bit about the power of partnerships, KJ? We have a phenomenal partnership and I know uh, you have amazing partnerships with customers and organizations in Canada. Can anyone really do this alone, this digital journey? No, I think that's a good point. I, I, I think it's very, very difficult to do it alone. I think that, you know, we have uh, great partners like Equinix, you know, Equinix brings excellence in the co-location facility. They bring excellence in the networking facility. They bring excellence by providing ways to interact with that in a programmatic way. And, and you know, as, as Sanj is talking about the security layers there, you know, uh, CDW Canada, we have great relationships with all sorts of technology partners, but, but you're absolutely correct. It's very, very difficult for any one partner to really do all of it. Um, but I think the opportunity really is where, um, you know, where agencies and organizations aren't able to do it themselves. That's where partnering with somebody like Equinix is key because you're solving those networking problems for them. And, and that's why, you know, again, we like to plug in with Equinix and work with customers because, you know, we want to help our customers solve problems. And, and so, yeah, so I think it's very difficult for any one partner to be able to do it. You have to create coalitions. You have to create, you know, groups willing to, to really work together to then meet the customer's needs. And, and so I think that's, that's part of the power of, of what we're talking about today. No, absolutely, KJ, I agree. I think it creates optionality that underwrites the decisions you make today. And also in the future, uh, that neutrality doesn't pigeonhole you into one choice that you can't evolve into the future. And also the consistent experience that you're able to provide around the world allows you to scale. Otherwise, it becomes quite unmanageable. Um, so those partnerships are critical to outsource what others do extremely well uh, because digital is becoming incredibly specialized as we think about the evolution. Um, so Sanj, I'm going to turn it over to you. I know there are some use cases that are of particular interest in the public centers. We talk about these partnerships. Would you take us through them, please? Yeah, thank you so much, Leanne. So first thing we're going to talk to you folks about today, the first use case, and this is a real world use case, is a national interconnect. So why are we talking about National Interconnect? So we've all experienced this during the early days of the pandemic, the enterprise traffic jam, the, the, the frustration that you have of trying to connect to an enterprise application sitting in a centralized data center, and there's just not enough capacity on the VPN for you to do what you need to do, right? To, order, to offer a true citizen-centric service, what we believe the solution to this is a centralized national backbone. But there are a couple of caveats to this. This backbone needs to incorporate security, agility, uh, and the ability for you to be cloud adjacent at any given point in time, or, or, or every one of these locations and at any given point in time, right? And really, the three things you're solving for here through this backbone are the physics of proximity, the economics of aggregation, and the network effect. And these are real world numbers. So by deploying your backbone in this manner, we can show you a cost reduction of about 60% when two parties connect to each other directly. We can also show you a 30% reduction in latency when these parties connect directly. And we can enable this connectivity immediately because each one of these sites has multiple participants that allows you to leverage their services on demand in real time, right? So how do you actually do this? This is what we call platform Equinix. So if you look at this red concentric, um, I guess, rounded square box here, this is the secure facilities we talk about. So in Canada locally, 13 metros with them. So from West Coast to East Coast, Vancouver, Kamloops, Calgary, Winnipeg, Toronto, Ottawa, Montreal, and St. John, New Brunswick, right? Within these facilities, we've got an ecosystem of telco partners. So for example, out of our Toronto site, this is just a fraction. 74 of them in Toronto to be specific, locally on the floor in our facility. And the least goes down to St. John's where we have, or St. John rather, where we have the big four or the big three at least, Bell Rogers or Bellis and Rogers, right? Bell Rogers and Telus. 
Now, once you're in this facility, you can do some interesting things. One, you can use our Equinix Cloud Fabric with 110 or 100 gig ports, right? And virtual circuit sizes of 10 mega, uh, 50 megabits to 10 gigs per second to seamlessly on-demand connect to the public clouds programmatically. Then what you can do is choose to deploy all virtual solutions such as SD-WAN, firewall, VPN, or routing to interconnect to the public internet and those clouds. Then what you can do is tie your branch offices, your HQ, your data centers directly into this ecosystem using our telco partners, right? And finally, you can leverage SD-WAN VPN ca uh, capabilities of, of these sites to allow your workforces to work from anywhere. Right? So going back to this, that's what each one of those hubs looks like. And this is a fully programmatic solution. Now, if we extrapolate this globally, it becomes really, really interesting, right? And even more so when we overlay it with our Equinix fabric that provides uh, in-country terrestrial paths connecting all of our Canadian sites, as well as our global sites to one another, right? So I've talked a bit about uh, automation. Why do we talk about automation and, and how can Equinix help you with this, right? So we, we view this as really digital first with the value of cloud. So what does that mean? It means one, focus on automation. So out of the box, we have native integrations with Ansible, Terraform, Packer, and Jenkins. Two, leverage agility. Use best practices for highly integrated sysops and automation, right? With integrated support processes. Get the most out of your public clouds with automated deploy deployment mechanisms and reduce time to market with your management costs. And finally, expertise. We have globally 50 plus certified architects in Amazon, 20 plus Microsoft certified architects and 30 plus Google Cloud architects. These are resources that are available to help you figure out how you, you leverage digital first with the value of cloud. And finally, APIs aren't the be all end all. We also have the good old fashioned pointy clicky interfaces that uh, can help you along your way. KJ? Yeah, and this is kind of where, you know, we help customers, you know, in this Equinix story is, is we have uh, great partnerships and, and great internal technical expertise with some of the core partners and, and some of the core technologies that you're going to want to deploy to support that. So whether it's F5, Cisco, Palo Alto, or Dell EMC. Um, and again, you know, we have uh, pre-sales solutions architects that can engage and help, you know, help you understand the differences between the different part, different technology vendors and, and really start your journey down the right path. Uh, but Sand, you're right. It, it really is a maturity um, approach. You know, how do you mature? How do you improve your, your agility? How do you improve your observability? And it's one step at a time. So, you know, where, wherever you are on that journey, you know, there are technologies to kind of help you. Uh, and, and we can we can help you understand that a little bit better. And people to help you as well. You're not alone. We've done this at Equinix and between Equinix and CDW, we've done this at 5,000 plus enterprises around the world with global deployments. Yep. And, and I'm gonna move through my slides pretty quickly. I think we wanna get to, uh, to Krishnan's demo. You know, just as SD-WAN and, and kind of what, what Sanj is talking about, you know, the ability to, to, from a high level, understand how does this work, understand it better internally to then understand how it's going to change your business. If you look, flip to the next slide, Sanj. Um, but, but when we do architectures, when we work with customers to do consulting engagements, we do all the way down to, you know, this port from this switch connected to this port on this switch at this speed. So, so, so it's really that high level understanding, but when we do engagement with customers, it's, it's, you know, all the way down to that, that detail, because again, you have options, but with options is complexity and, and we can help you, you know, plan for that complexity and execute. If you flip to the next one, and, and I'm going to go. I mean, I'm going to go through these really quick. I think you know part of this is is providing the slide deck so you're aware. But but whether it's it's managed network, you can flip to the next one. Um, you know, managed data center, you can flip to the next one. You know, or, or managed carrier. We have uh, a knock and a sock, 24 by 7, 365 days a year. The ability to uh, monitor, the ability to um, you know, monitor and take action as defined by, you know, a playbook that we work with customers on, or we have the ability to do uh, currency patching. So you want to be able to make sure that you have 
patches applied, you know, per the compliance that you need to rely on, you need to be protected against those, those identified vulnerabilities. We have the ability to do that patching on your schedule, you know, as part of our service. Perfect. Thanks, KJ. So this next one we're going to do is talk to you about a little bit about resilient disaster recovery. And KJ, I'm going to ask you to talk about, oops, one too many clicks, uh, business continuity to kick us off, please. Yeah. And, and, and the a, biggest thing with a quick yeah, time, gonna, oh. you got about five minutes, and then we are going to move to the demo. I don't, I don't mean to put you no, on no the problem. Back seat, but no, yeah. all good. Thanks. Man. <laughs> I think we'll get through this use case. We may have to skip the third one. Um, no, absolutely. So, so business continuity, disaster recovery, uh, we all got thrown for a little bit of a loop when it came to the pandemic, because maybe we plan to have our data at a second location. Maybe we plan to have a second office location, but we never really planned for not being able to get people together and having to work from home. And so, you know, business continuity, like everything else we, we do is a bit of a moving target. Um, but when we look at disaster recovery, you know, traditionally we think of the data, data center, you know, more and more it's become applications. Like, like applications is how we look at what we do. It's how we get our job done. I, I use my banking app. I use my, my messaging app. I, I use my coupon app at the grocery store. I have my QR code for my vaccination on my phone. It, it really is like we really look at, 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 at what we do it is the applications. And so how do we protect those applications? You know, we work with customers to define, okay, well, you know, let, let's make a list of all the applications. Let's group those applications. Let's look at the recovery point objectives. How much, how much data can you lose? How much business processing can you lose before it really is impactful to the business? How much time does it take to recover that? And again, when do you start to reach, reach those thresholds where it really drives, you know, problems for the business? So, but, but fundamentally, it's building that plan. So, so we work with, with organizations, agencies, customers to build that plan and help lay out, you know, how do we approach this? Really, what can we do to, to put, put that into, you know, implement a plan that will protect your data based on the RPO, RTO, and, and group those applications accordingly? If you can flip to the next one. You know, again, we, we, we leverage uh, application assessments. We do application migration assessments to the cloud from one data center to another data center, data center consolidations. But, but it's, it's fundamentally very similar to disaster recovery where you need to know about the applications. You need to make plans for those applications. There's compelling events where you can repurchase or rehost or replatform those applications, move them into SaaS services. Maybe you have an internal process that becomes part of ServiceNow or Salesforce in the future. Um, you want to flip to the next one? Yeah, and, and this is where we sort of bring it full circle. So when we talk about those, those sites across Canada, those 13 sites, one of the advantages you have is to do some creative solutions, and we'll talk about it. But at the end of the day, these sites, if you're programmatically deploying them, should be identical to one another. You should have a common security posture, a common compliancy posture, and a common disaster recovery standard. And the way we look at it is you can distill the six R's down into four common use cases right? One is something that's already being done today uh, at large, which is replicating workloads from on-premise in as di and disaster recovery to the clouds, right? So think of using the cloud as that instant disaster recovery mechanism. If you tool your infrastructure properly, this is, this is reality for you. Second scenario we have here that we'll, we can talk about really quickly is replicating enterprise workloads cloud adjacent to a provider like Equinix and then replicating into the cloud. Now here's where you get really interesting because this is truly digital, right? This allows yeah. you to use the best tool for the best application. And in the Salesforce example, this is key. So think of that digital infrastructure, that digital edge being now able to access Salesforce in a fully redundant manner or service now for part of your workload while using the public cloud or while using on-premise infrastructure like Equinix Metal, like Dell Apex, like HPE GreenLake, right? Scenario number three is deploying your workloads at Equinix in a fully digital manner, and then using the clouds as a disaster recovery mechanism, right? That's a very common deployment standard. And what we commonly see with customers doing this is using platforms like Google Anthos, um, Amazon Outpost Anywhere, uh, Microsoft Azure Arc to deploy these uh, infrastructure on-prem and do what they need to do. And finally, using Equinix as your delivery mechanism in a full digital topology, right? While replicating to the cloud. And this is the most interesting if you ask me, 
Because think of having footprints locally in Canada and say Calgary and Toronto or Calgary and Montreal or all three while replicating to the cloud for global reach, right? I can think, I think our partners, anything dealing with citizen centric services globally would benefit from this, right? Yeah, and you make some good points there. I, I really, I think the flexibility, you know, really allows, uh, you know, the agencies to deploy as they need to, to better meet the, the needs of their, their customers and the citizens that are using their services. So absolutely, um, you know, I think we're going to, we're going to speed through this. But again, you know, there's a lot of partners that are relevant in that, uh, that, that we, you know, we have close ties to, we, we have, you know, very good uh, internal technical expertise on those. And we do have a managed disaster recovery service. So, so as you're looking at, at building these out, you know, we can build it out on the Equinix uh, platform and, and you can have it monitored and managed and, and taken care of uh, 24 by seven uh, from our managed services team. If that, again, allows you to then focus on other business goals and objectives. Oh, absolutely. So, yes. Um, so I think we're going to go now, Sanj, because we've talked about this local base, global reach, speed, simplicity, consistency, and I think we're going to uh, see a live demo now. Yeah, we'll pass it to Krishnan uh, to, to give us a demo of all the cool things that you can actually do in real time. All right. Thank you, Sanj. Let me know if you can see my uh, screen. All right. So um, thank you again, you know, um, Sanj uh, and Leanne. Um, so what I'm showing here is that, you know, we've talked a lot about, you know, using sort of, uh, you know, anywhere, you know, connectivity, you know, for users, you know, because of the pandemic, you know, digital transformation has accelerated in many organizations. So users are nowhere, you know, in a central place. So what customers are looking to do is really, you know, to figure out how to best connect their users in you know, wherever they are. So what I'm showing on the map today uh, or um, to you is really, you know, sort of a um, coast to coast implementation. So I have a router that is set up in Toronto you know, we'll connect it to Google on the call today uh, to simulate the East Coast traffic. You know, I have a router set up in the New York area that's connected to AWS. And within the next few weeks, Canadian customers will be able to deploy virtual network services in Montreal. So it's just a matter of weeks, you know, we'll have Montreal Metro enabled. So that's what I'm showing here. And then on the West Coast, you know, we have now for the purpose, for the purpose of the demo, I have a um, deployment in Seattle. So um, once um, Montreal and Vancouver are on the virtual side, so you can have a network that completely, you know, traverses the Canadian side and does not touch the US, you know, for data privacy and other concerns as well. So, and then, you know, Sand just mentioned that, you know, these virtual uh, instances can be created in, you know, one of two ways, you know, a lot of customers, you know, choose to deploy using traditional, you know, point and click methodology. So that's what I'm showing to you now. So this is a workflow to create a VMware SD-WAN Edge instance. I'm going to deploy that in the Toronto Metro. So in, in, in four screens, and we'll be able to you know, get to deploying this device. And then once you um, press Summit, you know, it takes about 15 minutes to um, deploy the device. So think about you know, creating a national sort of uh, backbone you know, with um, sort of local presence where you can onboard the users and you can do this all within a matter of minutes, either using point and click methodology or I'll get to the, the cool scripting part uh, in a second here. So here I have, you know, again, you know, creating a VMware instance that is in Toronto, you know, we have my billing account all set up already. Um, the next step would be uh, just a few more details on what do I want to name the device, you know, I've got my activation keys, you know, this is deploying an HA version of VMware device. Um, and then the final step would be, you know, some of the security functionality, like what are the IPs, you know, that I want access to the VMware device. If I want to add additional internet bandwidth for the SD-WAN tunnels, and I can add that here. And then that's pretty much it. So this is the final step. And I'm going to accept the, um, order terms here, uh, and then I can go ahead and create the edge device. So, so that's as simple as that. And it literally takes uh, about 15 to 20 minutes for these devices to turn up. 
And once these devices are turned up, you know, I've already added internet bandwidth to it. So we can start to build SD-WAN tunnels to it and start directing user traffic. And then, you know, as Sanj and Leanne mentioned, uh, we have, you know, connectivity to all of the major CSPs in these metros. So if you do need to connect them to the CSPs, those connections can be done within a matter of minutes as well. Now, let me show you. Um, so this is a um, script that I've written. So this is going to basically, you know, create connections to Google Cloud um, for a device that I have in the Toronto Metro. And then it's also going to show you uh, creating a Fortinet SD-WAN device uh, in Toronto as well. So let me go ahead and uh, run my script. So it's going to initialize and start um, creating the, the objects shortly. So while I'm pulling up, you know, this is the, um, the device that I've created uh, in Toronto. So right now there are no connections to it. As soon as the device kicks up, you know, it's going to start uh, um, building. So let me say, go ahead and do it. So it's already creating my GCP connection. So let me refresh my screen here. Kind of fun with the home internet, you know, where everything is a little bit of delay. Uh, should refresh shortly here. There you go. So my two GCP connections are already created. So this is, you know, as simple as um, if, if you are into automation, you know, as Sand mentioned, it's very, very easy to do. The only next steps are to, you know, go in and set up BGP peering. And as soon as you set up the BGP peering, let's, let me, pivot back to here. So your routes for GCP will be advertised to your router uh, in Toronto and subsequently um, users on the East Coast will be able to access uh, GCP cloud uh, in Central Park because you know they're all connected through our backbone, which is uh, the private network. We call that the fabric. So let me see how things are going. So the two connections are already created and I've already gotten the email notification that uh, those connections are created. So let me show you here in this view, um, this is going to show me the, that device that I kicked off, the Fortinet device, it's starting to provision. So just as soon as it refreshes, you'll be able to see that it's uh, moving forward. It takes about 15 minutes to create, um, you know, um, you know, we wouldn't wait that long on the call here. But just wanted to kind of show you how easy it is to create. So, so if you're looking for, um, again, you know, creating um, these virtual pops, you know, that we've talked about in uh, not just in Canada, but this can be deployed in 18 metros around the world. So you may have entities in other parts of the world where you may need to connect these users locally. So this is the device that I kicked off. So it is, you know, initializing and it'll pro provision fully in about uh, 15 minutes. That's perfect. Thank you so yeah, much, Krishnan. Yeah. Let yeah, me, that's uh, perfect. Go ahead, sorry. No, I'll stop sharing and I'll turn it over to you for um, Q and A. No worries, and maybe we can come back to um, when it finishes provisioning in about fifteen minutes, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, so for Q and A, we have uh, one question in that came through the uh, platform, and the question on Grip was that. Would your organization be providing services for automating existing IT equipment environments and processes? Um, so the answer is sort of from an Equinix standpoint, a solid maybe, depending on if we're using our services. But I'll pass it to KJ for that one. Yes. <laughs> no, no, so yeah, I, I think that's a that's a great question. And and you know, one of the key things to really keep in mind when you're looking at these automation tools and services is you want to make sure that they are as universally uh, applicable across your, your infrastructure as possible. And so if you think of, you know, Krishnan just showed a really good example of connecting to the cloud and, and you know, provisioning via APIs, leveraging Terraform, you know, you wanna be able to take advantage of that across your on-premises data center, your cloud data center, and, and, and really, um, you know, 
make those as consumable as possible. Look at that composable infrastructure and, and, and composable cloud and, and, and really you know, focus on that infrastructure as code. So yes, um, and, and as you are exploring that, um, you know, really just think about a- applying it, you know, everywhere across your organization. One of the other areas that's really important to address is, you know, are you, um, are you automating the right processes? You know, are the processes you have really the processes that you should have? So from a process development standpoint, absolutely, we can ga- engage with you and, and help you with that. As far as implementation of, of automation tooling, uh, absolutely, we can help you with that. And then, you know, again, part of the power of the Equinix platform is being able to use those same tools to then orchestrate what you're, what you're consuming, you know, with, with your Equinix services and how you're connecting uh, to your other resources. So I think, you know, I, so I, I think Sanjay's kind of saying maybe, uh, but yes, we would love to help you with, you know, automating uh, and orchestrating, you know, how you're consuming, uh, you know, Equinix services. No, thanks so much, KJ. And we have another question in the chat from Lloyd. Lloyd says that this looks similar to cloud provider UI. So you're providing an infrastructure management platform where cloud provider is essentially another endpoint. That's really what we're doing. But to break down Krishnan's demo a little bit, um, and I'll ask him to chime in here in a second, is, is he's really showing you the platform with two separate tools. One is our cloud fabric or Equinix fabric that allows you that instantaneous connectivity to 300 plus you know, public clouds and accredited protected B clouds around the world. But the second platform is showing you is our VNF as a service platform called Network Edge. Christian? Yeah, so the Network Edge you know, allows you know, customers to have you know, virtual points of presence. You know, as I showed you, you can deploy these virtual points of presence you know, in a matter of minutes globally. And that leverages a fabric that Sanj talked about to connect you securely to these clouds and privately. So, you know, there, there is a, the security aspects of connecting privately to these clouds. Plus there's also, you know, it reduces latency and reduces cost, et cetera. All right. Perfect. Thank Thanks so much, Krishnan. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions in the chat that we can answer for anybody? I actually have a question uh, about, uh, it's Rob here. Um, Rob? How this can support environmental uh, stability in Canada? That's a really, really good question. So we'll take it from, from a couple of perspectives. One, um, let's talk about the facilities. So there's a term we use in the data center industry, industry called PUE, power utilization efficiency. And it's a ratio. What it means is for every watt of power we supply to a customer, how much power do we use to run the data center and do all the things we do to keep the lights on? So we run one of the most efficient data centers in the world. Our TR2 facility, which is the designation we give to our Toronto 2 site in downtown Toronto, has a PUE of 1.18. So that means for every one watt of power we deliver to an end customer, we deliver 0.18 watts, or we use 0.18 watts to run the facility. The most efficient facility in the world is one of ours, believe it or not. It's rated at 1.12, and that's in the Netherlands today in Amsterdam. And that facility kind of cheats, in my opinion, because they take all the heat generated and fun- funnel it to the university next door, and they get credits that offsets their, their utilization rating. But yeah, it's the same design. But that's step one. So bringing your equipment to a facility like ours. Now, where this becomes interesting is the more equipment that's in that facility, the more efficient we get, believe it or not. That's how we operate, right? It's not the good old days where you now need to leave you know, spaces like this between each one of your pieces of equipment. We stack it, we only cool what we need to do. But where this gets more efficient is when you start to leverage our digital services, because think of that physical infrastructure that it's built on. We're now building these farms that can take that physical infrastructure, deploy it virtually, and increase our green coefficient, right? So much so that if I scroll back here, bear with me to a slide that we didn't end up using, you guys can see this one, you can see the awards that we've actually won for ESG ratings. And the crazy thing is being in Canada, our green initiatives are are even better. So globally, we've got a target and a pledge to uh, be 100% energy neutral, 100% uh, carbon neutral by 2030. In Canada, we're way ahead of that curve right now. We're sitting somewhere around 90% 
carbon neutral in Canada through our sites in Quebec, through our sites in Winnipeg, um, and other sites nationally that utilize green energy. Now, what makes us even more interesting from a green perspective is just this year, we completed the last green bond issuance, but since, since uh, 2020, we've issued roughly $3.7 billion in green bonds that ties uh, payments and, and penalties to our attainment of those targets, right? So we put our money where our mouth is. And this, these are designations that all of our customers utilize today as part of their green energy strategy. And this becomes really more important given everything that we're talking about it, or that we was committed to just this morning by our prime minister at COPD or COP23, right? COPD is a disease. Didn't mean to say COPD. <laughs> COP23 this morning. But yeah, hope that, hope that explains a bit about our strategy. We're all about being green and we made friends with Greenpeace and the EPA, which is an added bonus. Uh, Leanne, do you want to chime in on that a bit? No, I, I think that's so important as our Canadian citizens are very concerned about environmental sustainability and that aggregation you talk about of the ecosystems removes so much unnecessary power usage, waste and cycle time as you optimize in the ecosystems and KJ talked about this as well. The more that you can bring these into the most efficient structure possible and have these omni-channel opportunities to, to connect um, only on an as-needed basis, you can, you know, not only is it green power to begin with, but you can reduce your need for wasteful power consumption as well, minimizing the footprint and then also offsetting uh, carbon with things like wind energy and fuel cells and, and these more sustainable readings. And it's very, very important uh, to our consumers and also in the enterprise space as consumers more identify with that, not just what service they're getting, but the uh, community impact of those services as well. Perfect, thanks so much, Leanne. We have uh, another question here um, by Lloyd. And Lloyd was asking, um, are you providing an infrastructure management platform where cloud provider is essentially another endpoint? <clears throat> yeah, so we, no worries. So we answered that one, Rob. And, and yes, the answer to Lloyd is yes. So what we do is our Thank fabric you. makes every cloud provider an endpoint effectively that you can programmatically connect to with five pieces of information, literally. Give the connection a name, a primary VLAN ID, a secondary VLAN ID, a service key, and choose the Metro and click go. And that's literally it. 90 seconds, boom, it's there. Thank you, sorry, multitasking here a little tiny bit. Um, I think there's another thing as in like, how are other public sector organizations uh, leveraging digital first? So that's a really good one. So I'm gonna answer this in a couple of ways. Um, one, let's talk about our, our neighbors to the South, right? They're, they're the, arguably the most advanced globally that's, that's, that we can talk about, let me rephrase that. That's the most advanced globally that we can talk about how they're leveraging digital first. So recently Congress passed a resolution that says the government of the United States must take a, a interconnection first approach to their connectivity needs. So what that means is they've now instructed departments around the US to um, leverage platforms like Equinix to interconnect with their counterparties and their peers to increase security, increase agility and reduce costs across the board, right? But where we're seeing um, really public sector modernize and, and embrace a digital first mindset is when you look at you know programs like uh, CERB, we all know CERB, right? came out of nowhere to save uh, a whole bunch of Canadians to keep us afloat at the start of the pandemic. Now, what a little known fact about CERB is that it was a fully cloud deployed platform, which was great, but here's where it gets interesting. And here's where CERB inadvertently was a digital first platform because as CERB now deposited money into everybody's bank accounts, what that did was use a digital first approach where it was using a combination of a cloud interconnect to on-premise to tie into the various banks to securely transfer money from one account to another, meaning from the government of Canada to everybody's digital account. Not a single check was sent out as a part of CERB, right? So that's an example of a digital first um, mindset being used by public sector around the world. 
The other one I want to bring your attention to also is what Leanne was saying. When you look at you know something on the surface that's as simple as video conferencing with um, your doctor or your healthcare professional. I mean, as an example, look at this Zoom session. This is a key example of digital first. Zoom, much like many healthcare providers, use the public cloud as the repository for their backend infrastructure. But what they do, or as, they, as the compute for their backend infrastructure, but what they do is they use edge nodes throughout the world at companies like Equinix, right? Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, where they're able to now seamlessly interconnect to all of the networks that gives them access to you. Imagine if you were sitting in Calgary and you had to go all the way back to Toronto for every single packet of this transaction. It becomes, it becomes absolutely crazy, right? Um, yeah. So that's, that's generally how public sectors are utilizing Equinix uh, around the world. We've got other municipalities, provinces that use us for cloud access. We've got um, other municipalities that build on digital first to provide citizen-centric services. And one of the examples we gave is Election Canada early on that, uh, that uh, Leanne and Rob were talking about, where the ability they had for digital voting, right, or digital voter registration, that was a game changer globally. First of its kind, I believe, in any of the in any of the G five, right, or even the G twenty for that for that uh, instance. Yeah, bring on the day when I can vote from my phone watching Netflix. I cannot <laughs> wait for that day. We're just about at time here. Are there any final thoughts that you want to leave with our guests? Yeah, there's actually one question I wanted to answer, and I'm going to pass it to Leanne for final thoughts. Lloyd asks, "What's our relationship with SSC?" Um, you can reach out to reach out to Paul Blue. We've got his number here. He'll tell you exactly who to interface with over there. Thanks so much, Lloyd. Leanne? Thank you. Thank you so much, Sanj. Thank you, KJ. Thank you, Krishnan. And thank you, Rob, and the entire Forward 50 team for inviting us to represent Equinix and CDW in really talking about bringing the very best of digital to our citizens in Canada. We look forward to continuing to work with you. We hope that you found our session and our conversation here insightful. And if there's anything else we can answer for you, please do not hesitate to follow up. We would love to share this information. We're incredibly passionate about it. And we look forward to uh, being in the audience for the rest of the conference. So thank you so much, Rob. And thank you so much to unpack here. I, you know, these are such uh, cup filling and rich conversations and the information is just so elaborate and in depth. Listen, the conversation continues and lives on on Port 50 and you have access to it for, uh, for a year. Plus you can uh, check out our speakers profiles, connect, collaborate, discuss. I really encourage you to find them on the platform, uh, ask for a meeting, you know, have a discussion with them. I'm sure they'll be more than happy to. Uh, Sanj, Lian, KJ, Krishnan, for presenting this workshop. Thank you very much on the future of citizen-centric services. And folks, that's a wrap for Tuesday. Join us tomorrow at 9 a.m. EDT as Alistair kicks off day two in the plenary section. You guys have a very good night. Cheers. Cheers.